Okay, good afternoon, I guess, technically. Um, as this new series is progressing, of course, Kati has had a wonderful series on networks for many, many years. But we decided this year that what we wanted to do was introduce each other uh, to each other in terms of the people who do network. So if you do networks, please talk to Kati um, about presenting in this series. And so I wanted to start today um, by introducing a framework that, uh, that many of us are using to make that transdisciplinary connection um, in terms of the kinds of research that um, we're doing here at IU. And so um, this obviously is oriented toward um, health, um, and illness and healing, but um, it, it could be applied and tailored to others because I think a framework is not very useful unless you tailor it into a model to the particular subject that you're looking at. But let me start with where this comes from. So I'm a sociologist, and for 100 years, those of us in sociology, we actually began with biological metaphors in our discipline to understand society and decided that that was a very conservative status quo approach because the organism to live has to have a certain kind of status quo. And so uh, fairly early on in our history, we began to reject and separate ourselves off from uh, the biological sciences and the life sciences in general. And that turned out to be maybe a necessary, but not a very useful thing to do. But I think after 100 years, um, what we see are uh, these three things have happened, and this brings us back together in terms of having a broader landscape of science to try to understand why people get sick, um, whether they live or die, and what they do in response to the onset of health problems. So the first thing, I'm, I'm, I'm fond of saying that the best thing that ever happened to social science was the Human Genome, Genome Project. And the reason that I say that is because the Human Genome Project uh, was designed to open the book of life. And it did for many things. But in fact, what we found out is that most diseases are what we call complex diseases. Only about 10% of diseases can be explained in terms of the sort of simple, traditional, um, Mendelian kind of genetics. And so one of the things that we learned was that um, we need to understand how the environment affects um, the, the genome in terms of putting that coding uh, of the epigenome. So by the turn of the century, we understood that the nature-nurture debate was dead that courses that started with, you know, we're going to show you how society matters more than the body, or um, courses which said, you know, we're going to show you that it's all about genetic inheritance. We no longer could say that in our classes because that distinction was obsolete. And so the movement that we've seen since the turn of the century is transdisciplinarity. Now, I say that on purpose because we're looking across the disciplines. I actually am not very fond of the word interdisciplinary. I like multidisciplinary, which to me means that people with great expertise, great and deep expertise in their own areas sit around a table. And that's what we're trying to do here with regard to understanding things through the kinds of interconnections that they have. So, Kati asked us to sort of give a background into how we got into this area. And my work, actually, I'm what's technically called a mental health services researcher. And what that means is that I try to understand how individuals get into treatment when they face an illness. Now, as a sociologist, and I think this is different um, for us versus people, say, in the medical school up in Indianapolis, I really don't care what the disease is. I don't care if it's breast cancer or Crohn's disease or mental illness. But mental illness is, is kind of fascinating because it's one of those things in which we don't have any uh, clear biological markers. And so it makes the line between nature and nurture much more fuzzy. When I got into this area, which um, is variously called help seeking, utilization research, um, the uptake of benefits, the dominant model was a rational choice model in which people either explicitly or implicitly weighed the costs and benefits of going to treatment in the face of the onset of symptoms. And so those things could be uh, whether or not they have insurance, how much it hurt, whether or not they had other obligations. And it was a very nice, elegant, clean, and sophisticated model um, that fit very nicely with survey research design and using the linear model um, for analysis. But as I sat there as a graduate student at Yale, I kept thinking to myself, I don't know anybody 
who makes their decisions to go to a doctor that way, that the world struck me as much more messy, much more complex. And so I proposed this thing called the network episode model, uh, which took fun as the fundamental um, treatise underlying how people get into services, the idea of social networks, that entering into treatment is a social process by which individuals who are pragmatic and social uh, go through a series of uh, not decisions, but they, they can be decisions, but they may not be decisions. I don't reject rational choice models, um, but I see them as... <laughs> I don't want to insult anybody, but subsumed into a larger framework in which sometimes people do things through what sociologists have called habitus. So that that um, and they may not be they may not come from you. They may come from others who, when you walk into the office in the morning, they say, you look awful. Do you feel OK? OK. And so that kind of thing. So the idea is that this model was different in that it saw individuals as pragmatic and social and that we needed to look not at the decision of whether or not people went to a doctor, but to look at the entire uh, little part of the life course, which, which was uh, dynamic and event-centered. And so we put the frame around the whole episode. And we focus on the pathway and uh, interactions in social networks as um, the underlying model. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but this is sort of just the, ba the background. Now, one of the things that we found as we were doing our research up in Indianapolis in the psychiatric units was that it turns out that our underlying hypothesis that there was not one decision frame that people used, but rather there were different pathways into care. And so what we did, with the first thing that we did um, when we talked to people in Indianapolis is we just asked them to tell us the story of how they got to the hospital. And then uh, we worked with both qualitative and quantitative researchers, and we found out, uh, we coded them into these three kinds of um, these three kinds of pathways. The first pathway is the rational choice pathway. That is, at some point during the onset of illness, individuals make a choice that they're going to go to a doctor. Okay, And we sort of bent over backwards to code things as uh, having a choice. If anybody said during their story that they, um, they decided to go, you know, I thought I was going to hurt my kids, and so I decided to go. We coded that as choice. And just under half of the individuals we talked to took a choice pathway. But the other thing that's interesting to us is that, and, and I think the focus on mental illness really brings this out, is that individuals can also be coerced into care. Now, when we think about coercion with mental health, we think about involuntary commitment. And that's what we call hard or legal coercion. But there's also soft coercion in that you decide that you, you don't really want to go, but somebody pushes you into it. Your employer says you can't have a job here unless you go for um, a physical and you might have a condition that's discovered there. Um, you might have uh, parents um, or you might be a parent who pushes your child into care and having vaccinations that they don't like needles, um, but they are coerced into care. We call that soft coercion or extra legal coercion. But the really interesting thing to us was that uh, we, drew, we uh, drew from the political scientist Charles Lindblom, who had coined this idea of muddling through is the way American social policy is made, um, because a number of the the stories that we saw were, in fact, people who told stories that they almost told from the third person point of view. They were not an active decision maker, and yet they were not resistant. But they just sort of bounced off of other people until they ended up in the treatment system. Um, but this also began my pathway back to biology, because one of the things that we found was that the factors that influenced whether or not individuals traveled a pathway of coercion choice or, uh, or muddling through was actually an interaction of uh, the biological and the social. So individuals with larger social networks were more likely to report coercion into care, and individuals who had bipolar disorder, and if you think about the nature of bipolar disorder, particularly the manic episode, uh, when people think that they're seeing better, hearing better, feeling better, have great ideas, they don't feel like they need to go for care. It's just everybody else knows that what they're doing is outside of, of the norm. So uh, these two things really affected um, the kinds of, of, of pathways that individuals traveled.
But we also want to put this in historical context. And so one of the things, the other things that I study, and I gather this is closely related to mental illness in many people's minds, but in fact, in sociology, these are two very distinct areas. The study of suicide has very strong historical roots in sociological theory. And one of the things that we found looking at this was that um, in this was in the 70s and 80s, we found that in fact, uh, religion continued to shape the probability that a county would offer up, in Durkheim's words, a quota of suicide. But what was interesting, we took it one step further, and we found that these religion, religious effects vary dramatically by what area of the country you were looking at. And when you thought about this, it's about how context shapes the effect of different religions. It's not only the prevalence of co-religionists in terms of networks, but it's also the idea of the network of organizations that religion set up to help people who are in trouble. So, for example, um, we found that the higher the, pr the proportion of individuals in a county that were uh, Jewish, that this was protective in New York City, but not in Alabama. Okay? Uh, the same thing for... Uh, Catholicism, although the effect of Catholicism is actually uh, more stable across the areas. And then evangelical Protestantism, we found, was very protective in the South, but not in New England, right, not in the Northeast. So we then see the, the context. And all of these things, um, you know, we continue to find in the literature other examples. So this is um, a study by Charles Kedushin, who's a um, a network sociologist in New York City, and what he found was that the effect of creating support groups for veterans with PTSD had opposite effects in urban and rural areas. So in urban areas, what we found, uh, what he found was that support groups help, but in rural areas, they actually are more stigmatizing and result in poorer outcomes. And if you think about that, in the rural area, the social network um, is very is is much more known to the everybody in the community. So when you drive your car up to the mental health center, everybody knows it. And so this actually put additional stigma on the veterans who are going for care. Okay. So the fundamental dilemma that sticking with uh, the, just a social network, an egocentric social network perspective, is illustrated when you think about religion and suicide. We have both kinds of studies. Sociological studies or social science studies tend to be contextual level depending upon suicide rates. Clinical studies tend to be studies of individuals who sought, sought care. And um, the, the findings, we couldn't tell whether or not, if you think about the religion issue, um, whether or not, when you think about those areas that have high percentages of Catholics, for example, who are the people who are committing suicide in high Catholic areas? Are, is it the Catholics who have fallen away from the Catholic Church, or is it the Protestants who are being driven crazy by the Catholics in that area? It's really not clear. And so each of these has a fundamental methodological issue. The clinical studies have problems with generalizability, and the contextual level studies have the old ecological fallacy program where people have a really hard time rem remembering to say, the, the percentage of Catholics in an area is associated with the suicide rate, as opposed to saying Catholics commit more suicide. That's not actually technically incorrect at that level. So trying to understand the transdisciplinary agenda is trying to understand the effect of the individual characteristics, the effect of the contextual characteristics, and then how those two come together. So the, uh, the uh, network episode model began to morph uh, first adding uh, the treatment sector because one of the things that we discovered very early on in our studies in Indianapolis was that the treatment sites were also, Im there were important networks in the treatment sites. Either the staff had better networks or they created a context through those networks that was a bit harsh. Um, and so uh, this is a dynamic network system as well, and then we try to locate it into context, and then we get, got to this, and then it got very complicated. So um, we started thinking about how to put together three levels. Now, there were no shortage of conceptualizations out there, and this might represent one of your favorite ones that you've seen in terms of the different kinds of models that are trying to link individuals in context. 
But in terms of thinking about it from a network perspective, there are certain requirements that I think would make for a important um, a model that is able to be flexible enough to bring in the different disciplines, but also have us talk together across the Tower of Babel. Because one of the problems that we have <coughs> excuse me, in the transdisciplinary agenda is that it turns out that we say we're, we mean the same things but use different language for it. So, for example, I think um, when I sat down to think about this, I thought about <coughs> excuse me, the requirements for connecting models. And so the first thing is that they have to have the full set of contextual levels. Excuse me. But I think the major problem <coughs> is that, as you saw in all those other models, there are plenty of those. But, okay, but what they didn't have was an underlying um, <coughs> excuse me <coughs> an underlying uh, mechanism or engine of action that connects things and they don't employ a metaphor analytical analytic language that is familiar to both um, <coughs> thank you to both the social and the I think I'm okay now to both the social and natural sciences okay and that they need to understand uh, the need for and use of the full range of methodological and theoretical tools. <laughs> so, um, and as somebody who sort of straddles the issues of both um, basic science and applied science, there needs to be a way to, the models need to have a way that we can intervene. And so one of the things about that is that the social networks and complex science really provide a way to do that. Because as we think about complexity theory, we have large-scale interaction units with relationships as the fundamental metaphors of human adaptation, uh, with networks as the active ingredients. And the nice thing about it from a social science point of view is it puts a human face on issues of access, barriers, interventions, and interventions by conceptualizing these as actions of individuals. And it introduces a way to connect the rest. And this is important, I think, because um, you know, when we think about what happens, for example, in treatment organizations, we tend to think of, in the, in, in the treatment uh, literature, we tend to think of this as you know, you, a pill is a pill is a pill, right? Or an intervention is an intervention. But one of the things that the network perspective brings to the fore is the idea that, in fact, um, it's not just the pill. It's whether or not the pill is given uh, with hope and care or whether it's given with sort of a quick you know, prescription and, and sending people out the door. So uh, these things really matter in terms of thinking about life and death outcomes. So I went back to my historical roots um, and started thinking about what should the underlying theoretical prediction plane look like. And I went back to Emile Durkheim's idea of the social safety net. So think of this as either an upside-down bowl or literally a circus net or an upside-down turtle shell in which you have two dimensions of social networks that are critical. One dimension is the level of regulation and the other is the level of integration. And so when you look at that and you see the, the, the ropes or the wires in the net, you can see that there are four dangerous poles. And these poles can be defined either by having too much or too little. And the most important um, or the, the optimal situation in terms of the functioning of any system, so exa for example, the personal network system, um, is to be at the bottom of the net, just like it is in a circus net. You want to fall in the center of the net where there's a moderate level of tension in the ropes, and so individuals bounce. But if you have too little regulation or too little integration, you have a situation in which the ropes are too far apart and when people have a crisis and they fall off the tightrope of their life, they have nothing to grab onto. Um, and people, when people think about networks, they think about this all the time. What we don't tend to think about as much, at least in social science, is the idea that you can have too much of a good thing that you can have overload situations in which there is um, either too much love, care, and concern, and so you're willing to give up your life for the group, 
And if you think about war heroes or you think about saints, those are all situations that would describe <coughs> altruistic social structures. Or places where there is <coughs> where there is too much regulation and people are forced to give up their life. So this became the <coughs> the foundation and the sort of theoretical prediction plane that I started with. And so the idea here is that in thinking about putting together um, a complex model, uh, which, which uh, apparently the physicists have told me is called a vertical integration model, right? And that's what I mean about how you learn things and uh, about the same language. So <coughs> we have biological foundations, uh, which is a network structure, social embeddedness, which is a sociological term, and from Clyde Hertzman, an anthropologist in public health, the notion of biological embedding, or how it is that network effects get under the skin. And so um, we began to theorize, uh, all of us in a group, about the idea of a social symbiome, and this is where we really needed to talk across groups, because you know, I know society, I hope, a little bit, but there are lots of areas I didn't know about that I knew were important. But the idea underlying the social symbiome is that it's the convergence or clash among network systems that drives sort of the onset of problems. In our case that we're looking at, uh, issues of suicide, mental illness, substance abuse, right? There are six key systems or concepts that we need to consider. Three are individual um, internal systems that are embedded in the external systems, um, that are embedded in external systems, and these shape the sort of dynamics that we see in terms of response to illness. And so it looks sort of like this, where you have a fractal structure of the, the basic theoretical Durkheimian plane, and um, it suggests that what we need to do in terms of thinking about individuals is to think about the pathway or life course that they travel and look at how these different networks affect what they do. And so to sort of set up for my colleague, Olaf, um, I don't know anything about this, and he's going to tell you all about it. Um, but in order to sort of have this model that really takes into account everything from genes to global structures, you have to have people at the table who really know what they're doing. And when they know what they're doing, there's lots of ways of knowing. Only one way, it's not the only way, but one way to do this is to have this theoretical unity around the idea that networks matter. So there could be many different kinds of models that connect genes to global uh, structures, but those of us who take a network perspective focus on interaction as the key dynamic that pushes social systems, both in terms of um, horizontal action, but also in terms of vertical action. So I just wanted to show something from a paper that we looked at that, um, that you know, is sort of my tiptoe into uh, looking at genetic effects. Um, worked with um, John Nurnberger up at the medical school on this and a number of other people up there at the Institute for Psychiatric Research. And they've had a very long-term study um, called the Collaborative Study of the Genetics of Alcoholism. And um, we wanted to work with them. And so... Uh, we said, how can we do this? And, and I just called John and I said, well, you know, I don't know about the genetics. Can we talk through that? And you write that kind of section up, et cetera. And he was like, yeah, that makes sense. And I said, he goes, well, what do you want to know? And I said, really, for this analysis, all I want you to do is send me the variable. That is the, you know, that, that gives you the predisposition. And the most robust uh, variable in alcoholism is the GABRA2 gene. And so he sent us that, and what we were able to show, uh, we sort of put out three different sociological theories to think about the idea of the interaction of gene and social structure. And what we found was that, you know, you had the traditional, about the traditional level of uh, genetic predispositional difference um, if you had GABRA2 or, or you were high or low in GABRA2. But as the level of social support increased, and remember, these are in, in quote-unquote alcoholic families, the genetic difference just about disappears. So that was kind of exciting for us in terms of thinking about the power of interdisciplinarity. So 
So the units are, it's a, it's, a, it's a social scale of about 10 items that measure whether or not they feel that they are, there is love, care, and concern in their families. It's a survey and, you know, it has a good reliability and it's a, a very well-known scale. So that's sort of where we're headed in terms of thinking about um, all of us being at the table and trying to have new approaches to understanding how the different forces in um, social life and in biological inheritance work together to affect these critical issues of who gets sick and who recovers and who gets treatment and those kinds of things. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Olaf, or did you want to do questions? <laughs> oh. We have five minutes. Just a question. Um, anything that you uh, found interesting? Um, <laughs> my, no, it's okay now. I think it's just that it's Monday. It was Monday morning. I was up late last night. Thank you. 
they might be willing to give the, the, uh, what they call the gold standard that is in the Soviet Union, for example, in Indianapolis, in the Indian section of Indianapolis, in Indianapolis, for an African American patient are not given prescriptive or the, the most effective diagnostic the providers just do what they want to do. So better to do the second and third policy regime than the other one, and 